Meet Canadian fashion designer Marissa P. Clark. Marissa is the owner and founder of Fawn Studio, which was established in 2018. Designed in Calgary, Alberta, and made sustainably and ethically in Clark's mother's birthplace, Vietnam. Marissa has a degree from the University of Victoria in political science and economic policy. With ambitions of being a fashion designer, she broke the mold and enrolled in the London College of Fashion in 2016. This up-and-coming contemporary women's wear wholesaler and online retailer is known for its whimsical and feminine pieces. Each item is timeless and charming, yet playful and bold. Clark's designs have graced the runways of Vancouver, LA, Paris, and New York Fashion Weeks. Staying true to her philanthropic roots, 100% of the proceeds from this passion project are donated to her mother's charity, BT Mekong Education Association, that supports education in rural Vietnam. We're here with Marissa P. Clark from Fawn Studio. Marissa, welcome to Culture Roulette. Oh my god, I'm bursting right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. You know, we, uh, we've been looking forward to uh, filming with you today. Take us uh, through, you know, the journey back in time where you're a teenage girl with big hopes and, and dreams, aspirations to break into the fashion world. Well, it's funny because in high school I wanted to be a member of the UN and that was my original goal. So I actually went and studied political science and economic policy in my undergrad and that's what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to start working for NGOs and slowly like work my way there. Um, and after a couple summers of working for NGOs and everything, I started to realize the frustration of trying to make positive change in the world from the outside and I realized that business holds so much power when it comes to like the actual decision making of how things are made and like how our economy works. So it was a very weird thing because fashion was something I loved and I grew up sewing, my mom taught me how to sew, um, but I never, it was something I would dream about maybe living in New York, working for a fashion magazine, but it wasn't something I was going to do. I had these plans, like I was going to change the world. <laughs> and it's funny though, because I feel like I have to kind of remind myself that that is really the reason behind Fawn, was I really wanted to empower people um, from our production in Vietnam but to our like wearers in Canada. So it kind of all tied in, like my philanthropy philanthropic goals also kind of met with my ability to be creative and take something I love like fashion and make it into a business. <laughs> I was reading uh, where an article where you were saying you were studying to uh, be a CFA and uh, you realized uh, that you know you wanted to do something creative and and uh, tell us about it, your entrepreneurial beginnings with Boca Imports and how that plays into uh, pre-Fawn Studio. I came out of university and I think like a lot of people at that age I went right into university from age 18 so there was no break um, and it kind of just felt like okay the next step is get a corporate job in Calgary. So that's where I got a job with Investors Group and I started studying for my CFA to be a financial analyst and at the same time, I had started Boca, which was kind of my passion project. It was me buying little accessories from my travels and then reselling them to Canadian people. Because um, I was always, I've always been into that, like with my fashion, I've always been inspired by finding unique pieces that you couldn't necessarily get at Aritzia or something like that. So while I'm studying for this exam, I'm running this online business and I'm realizing that's what I really love to do. But it kind of felt like, oh, well, that's my hobby. That's something different. And it wasn't until I passed kind of the first kind of admission exam 
and I just remember feeling my heart sink and be, being so disappointed because I was hoping I'd fail. So then I had an excuse not to do this because I felt like, well, this is such a wonderful opportunity. This is the way that I think my career should be going or the way that I think people will be happy for me. And it was in that moment of realizing how disappointed I was, it made me realize, you know, I need to finally just accept what I really want to do. So that's when I started taking online classes and I ultimately enrolled for a intensive fashion design program in London. Yeah, so you go from ACAD doing night classes in visual arts, graphic design, um, springboard into, yeah, the London College of Fashion. Um, yeah, this great uh, post that we're gonna put up on the screen here where you say you're in the zone in that moment at the London uh, College uh, of Fashion. It's a, it's a beautiful moment of you. Oh, okay, I remember this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see the, your drawings. One your... of my classmates took the photo of me because she said, she was like, you were just so in the zone, you were, didn't even notice me taking the photo and that's just how I felt when I was there. <laughs> the reason why I brought Ben here today to talk to you was because I feel like meeting him was such a pivotal point in my career. It was kind of everything that I'd manifested and dreamed of, and it really just allowed things to snowball and take effect. Ben Falconer is the owner of Per Boutiques and the director of Patty Falconer Agencies, businesses that he took over from his mother when she passed away in 2008. Not only was he the first fashion buyer to see potential in Vaughn, but he's helped me connect with a network of other models, photographers, stylists, makeup artists, and other creatives in Calgary. Together, we've extended the opportunities for young local models to walk the runways in New York, Paris, and some local pop-up events. Growing up in Calgary, I loved shopping the boutiques on 17th Avenue. One boutique I particularly dreamt about seeing my designs in was Purr. So when I started Fawn, I spent a lot of time researching Purr's clothes, like everything from price point to their fabric content. Prior to trade show season, I had emailed their buying team multiple times, but I didn't hear anything back. Lo and behold, fate took over and they ended up in my booth at the Project Women's Trade Show in Las Vegas. I remember that day because I was sitting in my booth working on some sketches when a group came through and started looking at our collection. Normally, I give buyers some time to browse the designs before I go and jump in and ask them if they have any questions. When I heard one of them say, wow, feel these fabrics, I glanced up at their name badges, and that's when I saw Purr, Calgary, and I couldn't believe they were there. Within several minutes of talking and going over our designs, Ben essentially said, yes, we're gonna stalk you. And that's when this whole connection and community started. It's been such a privilege working with Ben over the years. I have such a great deal of respect for the fact that he celebrates his mother's memory by keeping her dream and business alive. But beyond that, he also works so hard to connect people in the fashion industry, whether it's young models, photographers, or people like me. He's always the first one to contact me about an opportunity for a local shoot or show, and I really appreciate him for that. I'm here with Ben Faulkner, director of Per Clothing and the director of Patty Faulkner Agencies. Welcome to the Culture Roulette. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It's 2018, the first time you actually uh, had the pleasure to meet Marissa P. Clark of Fawn Studio. Do you remember the day you met her? Absolutely. It's, it's a funny story. So I've had these clothing stores now for I think 25 years now, and they're called Purr, and um, it was a buying trip, and we go down to Vegas twice a year to buy different types of clothes. Like, we're always looking for different things. Purr has a kind of an ethos and aesthetic that it's very specific and very particular what we want for our client. And go down with our managers, and we walk the hallways, and, you know, we usually give every brand about 10 seconds. And we're walking down the WW part of Magic, which is the sort of women's wear fashion area. 
and we slowly walk by Marissa's booth and I see this emerald green dress hanging on a body form and, and I think Aaron, who's one of our managers, says stop. And so we stop, we go in, and usually the first thing I do is I touch the garment. I don't know, it's like some kind of instinctual thing I've been doing for so long that it, it just kind of sticks in. And I touch the garment and I just could feel the quality of the fabric. And then we just started looking at it and we just started treating it like a brand, whether it was from New York, Paris or whatever. We just assumed that's what it was, and we just started getting ready to order it, and then we look over, and, and there's Marissa, and then it says Calgary, and I'm like, wow, how incredible is that? With our kind of hard, hard buying attitude that we have when it comes to buying clothing, we go all the way to Vegas to try and find brands from all over the world, and yet the brand that we stop for, that we want for our store, is from Calgary. So that's how I met Marissa. Wow. And you, you speak of the quality. What's funny is in my research this past two weeks, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, what sets Fawn apart is the fact that, you know, her production is, it comes out of Vietnam and the quality it's impeccable. That, that comes out of Vietnam in Saigon is just absolutely, it's an, you know. It's an incredible brand. It's an incredible story for someone from Calgary to do something of this high, high quality and to survive and continue to grow as an artist and as a clothing designer. Like I've been in the clothing game for 30 years and Marissa is, if not one of the best, one of the hardest working designers I've ever met. Two thousand and seventeen, the inception of Fawn Studio. Take us through that journey. When I graduated, I immediately went to Vietnam after, and I spent a month kind of living there, really trying to find pr like proper production facility and um, just going to fabric markets every day. And I kind of created a small little six piece collection. And I applied to Western Canada Fashion Week, which is this tiny little show, so different. Like it's crazy to think now that that was my first show because I was there like finding my own hair and makeup for the models backstage. It was just me directing everything. From there, I just kind of shopped those photos around and I just sent them to every fashion, like fashion runway production company I could think of. Um, and yeah, I got a couple opportunities to show at bigger shows, so I went to Vancouver and then LA Fashion Week the next season, and then I got a sponsorship from Global Fashion Collective who runs Vancouver Fashion Week. So it's kind of turned into a fun thing where fashion shows happen to be now my main mode of marketing when it comes to new collections, which is not what I envisioned for myself at all. I'm like, I just wanted to sell clothes to like clothing stores. Over the, the last, you know, five years with you know, Fawn, you've been featured on Forbes, Vanity Fair. How does that feel, like coming from Calgary and seeing yourself on these publications? I mean, sometimes it's hard not to get imposter syndrome, to be like, uh, it's just me, you guys. <laughs> this little person from Calgary, but I think I really was able to connect with what my story was, and I think reaching out to people they were able to feel that too and recognize that. So, yeah, I mean, Forbes was my goal before I even knew I wanted to fully be in fashion. So I'm very just, yeah, very humbled. <laughs> it takes to produce one cotton shirt takes around 2,700 liters of water to produce that one shirt. And that's the total consumption of water for a human to drink in the span of, for a single human to, to drink in that span of two and a half years. I know you have a, a big focus around eco-fashion, sustainability, uh, paying your, your garment workers in, in Saigon and Vietnam uh, a fair wage and giving them good opportunities. What is your uh, hope for the future in terms of having a, a part to play in sustainability? I really hope that people start to realize the impact of the clothing that they wear. Um, hearing a statistic like you just said is absolutely jarring and it makes you think like, well, is it really worth getting a $20 t-shirt from H&M if I know that's going to be the impact on the environment? 
So I think we're starting to see with younger generations, people becoming more aware of this and the fact that sustainability and ethical production is so important to our consumers really gives me hope um, that that's a selling point for Fawn. With Fawn, I really tried to focus on timeless, special pieces and not just like something that you're gonna throw away after one season. So I try to really move away from trends so there isn't that that feeling of like having to replace it every season. Do you remember uh, visiting your Yes, I do. Oh my God. How was that experience? I just love them so much. I remember after one of our first meeting, at the end of it, they all clapped. <laughs> and to the moment that, like from the moment that I walked in, I just felt so welcome. And I just remember the last time I saw them, them putting me in the cab and waving as I drove away. And it just like, I don't know, I just, I love these women so much. And it just reminds me so much of my heritage and the culture that I grew up in. So being able to support them and see them be so proud of the work that they're doing, that just means the world to me. In the world of fashion, you're traveling the world essentially. How important is it to have a friend with you, an assistant? What can you tell us about Rebecca Graham? <laughs> Oh my God, I love this photo of us. <laughs> Here, everyone at Fashion Week has had these serious faces and Rebecca and I are doing a full, oh, I love her. Rebecca's one of my really good friends that I met in at University of Victoria. Um, and when I started Vaughn, she was just kind of the first person that I thought of, because I feel like we just have such a good relationship. Like, she really just knows how to read my mind and having her backstage at shows is just a lifesaver. I wish she was here because she has some hilarious stories of literally duct taping dresses to, to models' boobs to make sure that it didn't come open on their runway. She literally cut a turtleneck off of one model because the model had gotten her makeup done and then didn't want to ruin the makeup taking it off. And Rebecca's like, I don't want to cut your shirt. I don't, like, there must be another way. And the model's like, just cut it. <laughs> so, yeah, she has gone through the ringer for me and you've met Rebecca. She's just such a lovely person, so. I'm really happy to have her be a part of my team. How is it doing fashion in your own country, like doing a fashion show in Vancouver? What does that feel like? Um, Vancouver is always my favorite place to show in because I have a lot of friends that live there. And I mean, one of my guy friends who's not at all into fashion, just kind of arteric sort of guy, he told me that Vancouver Fashion Week is his favorite night of the year because we just, have so much fun and the support that I get from my friends is amazing. Um, I always have Rebecca backstage, but I'm able to you know, sneak another friend back there and get to experience it. And um, yeah, I think it's just so, so great to feel that connection to the Canadian com community. Back in 2019, you actually uh, helped me attain a dream I never thought that I would get to experience in my life. Here's a picture of us in over at Fawn Studios. You gave me the opportunity to curate your uh, runway music uh, for, for New York Fashion Week. Uh, and I even think that year was Vancouver as well. Do you remember being at New York Fashion Week for the first time and tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I mean, that was incredible. You mixed an entire, I think, 12 minute track for my runway show. And I had so many people asking me afterwards, like, where, where was that? Like, who did that? Um, and that was such a cool experience, being able to go into your recording studio and hear my voice on a track, reading that poem. Um, and yeah, I wish you were in, I wish you were in New York oh, with us. <laughs> I know, uh, but even uh, watching it over Instagram Live, I was just, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, you know, the models, beautiful models w walking down that runway to the music that created, you know, a couple of months prior, it was almost serendipitous because I was really proud of all those creations. And, you know, I wanted to be able to thank you for giving me that opportunity because Sonically speaking, in, in New York, um, 
is just uh, a dream come true. Yeah, you I mean, feel like one we of both my got to <laughs> get true. a dream come true and at the same time. Yeah, so thank you for that. What does the future hold for you and what are your aspirations besides Tokyo, which is a great aspiration? You know, breaking into the Asian market would be phenomenal, right, for you. Is there something else that you're thinking uh, outside perhaps of Fawn Studio or what does the future hold for you? I mean, I have a lot of plans and the one thing I heard was you don't want to tell people your goals because sometimes articulating them gives you the same satisfaction as completing them. So even with Fawn, I'll like to surprise people like with what shows I'm doing or what my plans are. Um, but I definitely want to expand my business um, in a way that I make sustainable production available to other fashion designers and other brands in the industry. So I definitely want to start maybe some, some, some production stuff down in Vietnam, we'll see. Um, and yeah, and we've really had to shift to online sales over the last year and a half. So definitely growing my online business and starting to, I think, make that my, my main source of income because I've really seen like a decline in wholesale sales. So really expanding my online business is another goal right now. I know you're a globetrotter, like you've been all over the world. <laughs> right? And, and how has that inspired your fashion? I think that's like been one of the biggest things that's inspired it. Um, I was always someone, when I travel, I would love to go to craft markets and shop their jewelry, embroidered clothes, different accessories, um, which kind of feeds into Boca Imports. Vietnam is always at the forefront of that. Um, it's my favorite place to travel in the world. If you've never been there, definitely you need to go. Everything from the food to the people, it's incredible. So I think that has always just driven my love of traveling and exploring new places. Because being in Vietnam, I've been, I think, six, seven times now over my life. And every time I see something new and I experience something new, I think like, yeah, just really immersing myself into that culture got me interested in other ones. And I think once you start traveling different places, it's addicting, <laughs> you don't want to stop. You, you think of the connection of like Vietnam during the Vietnam War and how that sparked the hippie fashion movement too, right? Like that whole, you think of Woodstock 69, you you see the flowers, you see the afros, you see, you think of Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock 69, Janis Joplin, Sly and the Family Stone, they all had their own style, even Joe Cocker uh, singing, I need a little help from my friends. Did you ever um, have family members talk to you uh, in Vietnam about their experience during the Vietnam War? Yeah, well, my mom lived through it. Um, <laughs> she tells this story of, you know, she got to a point where she wasn't able to go to school anymore because all the schools got shut down in her rural hometown. And she tells this story of seeing an American officer one day when she was walking like through her town and going up to him and saying, I want to fight in the war. I want to fight the Northern Vietnamese. She's like, I just want this to be over with. And she was about eight years old on the time, at the time. And she was so excited because he's like, okay, get on the back of my um, motorcycle. And she thought he was going to take, or a bicycle. And she thought he was going to take her to the middle of the war camp. And then he goes and drops her off at home. Um, but often their family would have Northern Vietnamese soldiers coming into their house and demanding food. So um, a lot of the time it was the kids that weren't eating and they were just sitting there as, you know, people came in and invaded their houses. Um, luckily they weren't subjected, like one of the areas that was subjected to like some of the chemical gas attacks, but um, I think it was just a very, very sad time in Vietnam. And I think I still have a hard time really comprehending what it was like. Like my oldest, my mom's oldest sister lost her husband in the war um, and she still just doesn't really even talk about it. And she was, I think, a lot older, so she was able to 
she really experienced it. But I mean, it's, yeah, incredible to see like this small country, Vietnam. I mean, it's known internationally now and that's kind of what brought it, you know, into the limelight. But like you said, that's really interesting how it did, it influenced our culture here. What can you tell us about the influence of your father? Oh, the on infamous you. Polly D. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, I think he really gave me the courage to start my business. Um, I remember, yeah, like I remember being so lost in my career. Um, at this point, I had quit the CFA, was working another office job and hating it. And I remember telling my dad, I just was like, I feel like everyone's so proud of me and I don't want to let them down. And I remember he said to me, he's like, Marissa, I raised you from the very day one. He's like, I just wanted you to be a beautiful person inside and out. He's like, I just want people around you to feel your kindness, to feel your happiness, to feel your joy. So he's like, you being miserable in a job isn't gonna accomplish that. And I remember him saying that and it was just like that moment that I realized I'm like, yes, like I was so worried about making him proud, but then I realized I'm like, what I thought I was doing to make him proud was actually the opposite. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, you've met my dad. He's just I love the kindest dad. person I know. Do you remember like after he saw the first kind of fun studio show in New York, do you remember anything he was able to tell you after the show that you remember something post uh, show that you shared with your dad in New York? Um, well, the funny thing is, is my dad said, he goes, yeah, that was my favorite collection, better than any other designers, but I still think you could improve. <laughs> And at first I was really upset. I was like, Dad, that was like my best collection yet. Like, I'm so proud of it. But like looking back now, that's really how I feel. And like, that's, I think, a testament to my success is the fact that I feel like nothing's ever perfect. Like I'm still learning with each show that I do, each collection that I make, I think it's getting better. So it's better than just getting to the top and plateauing. <laughs> I still think, like, like my dad said, I think there's still work to do. How has your... Um, mother inspired you. Oh, these are my favorite pictures. Notice how I'm wearing the really ruffled dress. That was 100% me. I refused to wear anything if it wasn't a full ball gown. Um, yeah, my, my mom's my, I said my dad's my biggest inspiration, but my mom's also my biggest inspiration. Um, she immigrated to Canada from Vietnam kind of iffy because she didn't have a proper um, birth certificate, so they don't know exactly when she was born. But she left her family behind after the Vietnam War and came to Canada because she just wanted to create a better life for herself. And she really saw, just like, she struggled so much, wasn't able to go to school, like a lot of, most of the time during the war. Um, so coming to Canada alone was just insane. She lived in a refugee camp in Malaysia before getting on the boat coming to Canada, people around her were dying. I can't even imagine the trauma. Um, and her first job happened to be with the seamstress in Medicine Hat. And she'd kind of like hand sewn, but she'd never used an actual sewing machine before. But within the first day, she just kind of watched the lady that ran the shop and slowly figured it out. And next thing you know, she's like an amazing seamstress. And she sewed actually the dress that she wore on her wedding day and taught me to sew. Like I, probably around the same age as kids are starting to use like crayons and <laughs> starting to draw, my mom was giving me her needles to help her thread them. I was doing embroidery for fun, um, sewing my own dresses and everything like that. So I think when I was trying to find my purpose, those moments really came back to me of like, you know, I love, I just love those moments with my mom. And yeah, like I, I just remember my first Vancouver Fashion Week, looking at the rack of clothing and kind of realizing like in that moment, I'm like, this is what karma is. Like this is like all the things that my mom did through her life, it has come through to me. And like without her, without her influence, like this collection wouldn't be standing in front of me. 
Like I felt like every part of it was just like a bit of her that I was creating and putting into my clothing. Wow. <laughs> what's a, what's a, another great memory you, you remember like uh, of your mom that you kind of, maybe when y you are missing her, um, you know, on Mother's Day, you know, it's coming up. What is a moment that you just treasure, like you just feel her like right there with you in that moment? Um, I have this really <laughs> random memory of when I was maybe about four or five years old and I was having a tea party for like my stuffed animals. And I remember my mom made little mini bo bowls of pho for all my stuffed animals. <laughs> so we were sitting around and having our little mini bowls of pho at our tea party. So cute. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, definitely like a lot of just memories of her being in the kitchen and helping her. Well, not so much. I'd be allowed to chop and stuff, but yeah, she, the seasoning and all the actual cooking was up to her. But yeah, that was always great memories and I think my other thing that I always think about on Mother's Day is gardening, because my mom was something, she never had an official birthday. She chose July 7th, because she liked 7.07. Um, so she was never big on celebrating her birthday, but the one thing was Mother's Day, she would always say, like, this is the day that I just want you to stay at home and garden with me. So every year on Mother's Day, I garden and I think about her. Well, Marissa, thank you so much for being with us on Culture Roulette. We wish you nothing but success in the future uh, with Fawn Studios and um, hope to work with you again very soon, perhaps next year in, in Vietnam. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing. My pleasure.